Welcome to the 334th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. Stay tuned for my interview with Alexandra Monier, author of the DC Comics Icon Series novel, Black Canary, Breaking Silence. Stay tuned for the interview. If you're new to audiobooks, they're the perfect way to get more books into your busy life. Listen to audiobooks during your commute, while doing chores, walking the dog, or just relaxing at home. All you need is a smartphone and the free Libro.fm app. If you already love audiobooks and don't know what to listen to next, check out recommendations and curated lists from people who know audiobooks best, your local bookseller. Reading and writing podcast special offer, get two audiobooks for the price of one with your first month of membership with code RW podcast. That's code RW podcast for two audiobooks for the price of one for your first month of membership at Libro.fm. Well, welcome back to the reading and writing podcast. My guest today is Alexandra Monir. Alexandra is a best-selling young adult novelist, including the best-selling time travel romance timeless. Alexandra is now joining the New York Times best-selling DC icon series with her brand new novel, Black Canary, Breaking Silence. Alexandra, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Great. Well, if someone hasn't heard about your new novel yet, Black Canary, Breaking Silence, how would you describe the novel? Well, um, it's actually been described a lot. I've, I've heard it described a lot as like The Handmaid's Tale meets the DC universe. And um, it is set in a dystopian near future Gotham City ruled by this shadowy, sinister organization called the Court of Owls. And uh, the Court of Owls has largely, it's a um, deeply patriarchal organization that has largely stripped women of their rights, including the right to sing. And our story centers around a 17-year-old girl named Dinah Lance, who, unbeknownst to her, is one of the very few girls in Gotham City who still has power within her voice. And it's all about how she uses that power um, to essentially start a revolution in some ways. So it's um, it's been so exciting to work on it because at the same time as it's a, you know, big superhero story with a lot of action adventure and some of your favorite Gotham City characters play important roles. I also got to write about, you know, some deeper themes as well. And so what led you to writing in the DC universe with this new Black Canary novel? So it was um, it was just kismet, honestly. I was on tour for my 2018 book, which is called The Final Six, and it's a young adult sci-fi novel. And because of that book, I was invited to a lot of different comic cons and conventions like that. So it was actually at uh, WonderCon, which is a fabulous uh, fantasy convention. Um, it was there that I was introduced to these fabulous editors at DC Comics. And I ended up seeing these same editors at different book festivals over the course of this year. And um, as we got to know each other, and they found out about my musical background, because I was a teen pop singer in my former life, they actually suggested to me that I would be a great fit to write something about Black Canary, since Black Canary's superpower is she has this canary cry. She's got this voice that can shred metal and demolish enemies and do all this amazing stuff. And so in a number of comic books, they have kind of played with that and and expanded her vocal power to include music and singing as well. So that's why um, these DC editors thought of me. And I started writing up a pitch initially for it to be a graphic novel. But then as I started writing and this whole idea of this dystopian, you know, near future Gotham City came to mind and the story I wanted to tell, I started realizing this feels like a prose novel. And um, I still really hope it ends up getting adapted to a graphic novel as well. Um, that would be the ultimate dream full circle situation. But I really felt like it it, lend, it lent itself to the DC Icons series. And um, at the time, there were only four books. Mine is the fifth. And they were four 
incredible number one global best-selling authors that had each been selected to write, you know, a different superhero in the series. So um, I knew like it was a very long shot that I would even get to do this, but I just really believed in it. So I asked my agent to send my pitch to the editor who handles, um, who is spearheading the whole DC icon series for Random House. And he did. And the rest is history. (laughs) <laughs> and so what was the process of writing in this licensed universe of DC versus writing one of your original novels? I think the biggest difference is just knowing that, I mean, these are DC's characters. They own the characters. This is their baby as much as the story is my baby. You know, the characters are their baby. And so it was really being aware of that. And well, I was really lucky in that they gave me total freedom to tell the story I wanted to tell. I wasn't at all boxed in in that way. Um, I was also very careful about maintaining true to the characters and who they are. And even though in the case of Black Canary, I was writing a new origin story for her. I was very true to, you know, the tenets of her character. Um, And so I would say the biggest difference is that at the end, when I was done with the book, Um, you know, editors from Warner Brothers and DC both read it and gave me notes. And um, there wasn't anything huge. It was more, it was really the things I had to tweak were more on the character level. Like, for example, you know, if I had a, if I brought in an iconic character, and I had them be like, really scary and villainous when they're not necessarily when they're more like a bumbling criminal in the canon, you know, as opposed to being terrifying. Like that wasn't, that was an example of where I had to swap out, you know, or change which character I was using. So things like that. And then since then, um, you know, in the promotional process, uh, whenever I'm, you know, whenever we're creating marketing materials or if I'm writing essays about the book or things like that, that's all stuff that, you know, DC and, and Warner Brothers, um, you know, looks at first. So, and it's cool to see how careful they are because this is, it's nice to see like these characters should be protected that way. Sure. Well, I know that your parents are both Iranian and your pen name Monir comes from your maternal grandmother, the yeah. opera singer Monir Vakili. Yeah. Um, how did her story and experience during the Iranian revolution inspire you in telling Black Canary's origin story? Oh my gosh, it completely inspired me. Um, I think when I first started you know, thinking about writing a story about Black Canary, what really struck me as so amazing was the idea that her pow- her superpower is her voice. And the reason it struck me as so amazing and so revolutionary is because um, in Iran right now, even to this day, women can get severely punished for singing publicly. And it didn't used to be the case in Iran. Uh, when my grandmother was she she was a big star in Iran. She was an opera star on TV, on the stage. Uh, she had an incredible career. There were pop stars like Gugush, who, um, you know, any, anyone Iranian sort of grew up knowing her as like our Madonna, basically. And, um, you know, there were these incredible iconic women. But then in 1979, there was a revolution, kind of like the opposite revolution <laughs> as my book. <laughs> this was a revolution that Um, kind of took a country that was very pro women's rights and really stripped those rights. Um, And so when the revolution of 1979 happened, and there was this whole regime change, I mean, just overnight, my grandmother lost everything, like lost her country, her career, the opera company she founded was shuttered, the school that she created for um, the first co-ed boarding school for classical singing that she founded that was shut down. I mean, just everything. And, um, you know, that pop star I mentioned, Gugush, she was basically like locked up for 20 years in Iran, unable to sing and only in like early 2000s escaped. So, I mean, it's very dire. And obviously, you know, singing is kind of like the, you know, when you compare it on the level of human rights issues, I'm not saying singing is the most important. But for me, it's so huge. It's like it's someone taking such it's like someone taking your joy away from you and also just this idea that our voices are less valuable because we're women so for me it's something that growing up i was always i i was born you know long after this but um you know growing up it was such a part of my family history there was always a lot of sadness around what happened and especially because my grandmother 
passed away in a car accident, um, you know, a couple of years before I was born. And so, you know, that's something else that, you know, wouldn't have happened probably if she had still been in Iran. And, and so it's just kind of like, there was a lot of sort of. Nothing waits for a farmer, not the weather, the banker, the crops. It's never at a farmer's convenience. So when it comes to crop protection savings programs, how come they get to ask you to wait for a rebate? Don't wait for rebates. Get the True Choice offer from Corteva AgriScience for instant upfront savings on crop protection products. Ask your local Pioneer sales representative or your crop protection retailer about the True Choice offer from Corteva. But don't wait. Sadness around our family history, understandably. And I'd always kind of wanted to write about it. And it's just so interesting that in the most American of projects, like a DC superhero <laughs> novel, I finally found my way of being able to tell this story without it being so, you know, depressing. You know what I mean? Like I was able to tell it in a way that was really invigorating because I got to write victories and triumphs that my grandmother didn't get to live long enough to have, you know, I got to write those. So that was really, really fulfilling. So do you remember the first fiction that you ever wrote? Yeah. You know, I don't remember specifically which one, but I was really young when I started writing stories. I mean, there's pictures of me on family trips at si as early as six years old, and I'm writing in notebooks. And I mean, it's all these like crazy block letters and terrible handwriting. And I don't know how anyone could figure out what it was. But I, I remember back then I was telling stories, always writing them. And then I think when I was around eight years old, I got my first like computer. And so I started typing up stories. And from like between eight to 10 years old, I was writing about me and my best friend, Roxanne, and I would create all these fictional adventures for us. And my parents were really great and supportive and would print them out and send them to family and friends. And I know that that was a great motivator because I got attention <laughs> for writing these stories. So what was your journey to then writing and getting your first novel published? So it was very unconventional um, because, like I mentioned, I did start my career as a teen pop singer. I was on, growing up, I was on a very dual path because I've been a bookworm since I mean, literally before age two, my second birthday party pictures are just me glomming on to whatever people got me. Oh, the only people that bought me books, like that's all I was interested in. Um, so I was always reading, always coming up with stories. But then at the same time, I'm a Gemini. So I also had this whole performer side and I loved plays and acting and singing and just all of it performing. So I would say around middle school, high school, I got deeper into, you know, the community theater, all of that. And then at 14, I just woke up one day and wrote a pop song. And then I just couldn't stop writing music. And this was around the heyday of, you know, the whole like Jessica Simpson, Britney Spears, Mandy Moore, all that stuff. So it was a very good time for me to kind of be young and writing music. And so I really ran with that for a while. And, um, was opening up in my junior year and senior year of high school, I got to open up for different pop stars on tour. And that was really exciting. But I was always writing stories in the meantime. So I had representation with an agency already for my music. So at about 23 years old, I came up with my first idea that I really felt like was a book. Up until then, I'd been kind of toying with TV or film ideas. But when I came up with this time travel romance, I was like, this is a book. And so because I was already represented for music, I just basically asked them, I said, can you connect me with someone in your literary department? And I was fortunate that she liked my pitch and sent it to Random House. And I got a deal from that. But that was, it was kind of amazing because it seemed like it really fell into my lap. And in a lot of ways it did, but I had been struggling so much on the music side for like so long that it was kind of <laughs> funny. It was like, you know, you pay so many dues and have so many heartbreaks. I mean, I had three different major record labels that were developing me at one time or another, and then someone would get fired or something would happen, you know, um, because music industry, there was so much turnover with, as you know, the music industry has changed so much. So 
It's interesting. I feel like when I tell my story on the publishing side, it seems like, wait, what? You know, you wrote this short proposal and your first pitch, you got the deal. Like, that's so crazy. And it was, but then it's it's almost like <laughs> it's sort of made up for the years and years of almosts on the music side and getting so close so many times and like not making it there. Um, but then I really found where I belong with writing. I'm much, much happier. Well, what writing advice would you offer for those who are writing their own stories and novels? Oh my gosh, so much. I think um, the biggest things that helped me were, first of all, being being a an avid reader is the biggest one. I know people give that advice a lot, but it's so true. And I think reading a variety of things, um, you know, I, as I, especially as I was honing my craft, I was reading everything from the most popular bestsellers of the day to then going back and reading Edith Wharton and, you know, classics that, classics that resonated with me. I think there are a lot of classics that are, you know, definitely outdated and don't need to be studied, but there are some that you can really learn from too. So you kind of have to see what resonates with you in, in terms of the classics. But, um, but yeah, I think just reading widely is huge. Um, and then I would say, I think momentum is, is also really important. I think it's super easy. I still, I can still fall into this trap myself today where, you know, you get really busy with life or you get busy with promotion, the promotion cycle for a book and like the days start to tick by where you haven't made progress in your work in progress. And then it starts to get harder to kind of reconnect with your story. So I think setting a reasonable word count goal for yourself, if you're someone that really, I don't think there's any right or wrong speed with writing. You just have to figure out, are you someone that is fast? If so, maybe you'll assign yourself 2000 words a day. If, if you're someone that labors over each word, maybe 500. Um, but I think setting that goal for yourself is really important to maintain the momentum. And it just gets you, when you know you have that goal to hit, you might sit down and think, I have no idea what these words are going to be about today, but something always comes if you just sit down and force yourself. So what fiction or nonfiction books have you read recently that you enjoyed? Ooh, so many. Um, the, <laughs> one, the one that I'm still thinking about, and I love so much is um, Kylie Reads Such a Fun Age, which I know was like the debut of this year. It was so good. Um, it was a really fantastic um, contemporary fiction. It's not young adult, it's grown up novel, but mm -hmm. it was so good. And it was, it was such a great character piece. And there were some really amazing relationship dynamics in there. And it just, um, you know, it talked about just all the different all the different perspectives we can have when we enter into it's, it's basically about this privileged white mother and her black nanny who comes from, you know, less money and that relationship and, and how they interact with each other and how, you know, the mom is, you know, wants so much to basically like be best friends with this nanny and but just all the differences between them and how the mom is just so unaware of her blind spots and it's just it's so it's so good and there's like a whole love triangle in there and oh my god it's just amazing so I really recommend such a fun age I could not put it down and there were some scenes in there that were so good as far as tension and you're like on the edge of your seat and I, yeah I feel like you could study that for for great dialogue and for tension. Um, another one I really loved was um, The Guest List by Lucy Foley, which was a, a big mystery novel this year. I tend to be someone that can really guess the twist, and I did not guess the twist with this one. And in Young Adult, I recommend Lobizona by Romina Garber, which is fantastic. It's a fantasy novel um, that is centered around it, that's actually centered around a very, uh, very contemporary issue of the immigration crisis, but it involves werewolves and it's just amazing. It's so good. Um, so yeah, I think the things that I tend to really recommend and gravitate towards are like addictive page turners, but that all also have something kind of deeper beneath the surface. Well, where can people find you online if they want to learn more about you and your novels? 
Um, I am online, I probably the most on Twitter and Instagram. So Twitter, my handle is at Timeless Alex. I made that when my first book, Timeless, came out. And I'm stuck <laughs> with it. So good, good thing my, my first book wasn't some, you know, more kind of quirky <laughs> name. I'm glad Timeless will work, I guess, forever. Um, and on Instagram, I'm just at Alexandra Monier. And then I'm also, um, I also have a website, just alexandramonier.com, A-L-E-X-A-N-D-R-A-M-O-N-I-R.com. And so, um, yeah, definitely stay in touch. I'm, I always have different things, news I'm announcing or fun things related to the books. And I also love uh, connecting with other writers too. Great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Alexandra Monier, author of the new novel, Black Canary, Breaking Silence. The novel is on sale now, so go buy a copy. And Alexandra, thanks for doing this interview. Thank you so much for having me. It was so good to talk to you. Great. Thanks a lot. Nothing waits for a farmer. Not the weather, the banker the crops. It's never at a farmer's convenience. So when it comes to crop protection savings programs, how come they get to ask you to wait for a rebate? Don't wait for rebates. Get the True Choice offer from Corteva AgriScience for instant upfront savings on crop protection products. Ask your local Pioneer sales representative or your crop protection retailer about the True Choice offer from Corteva. But don't wait.